faculty members, I'd like us now to welcome Dr. Olusimbe Ige and Dr. Julian Watkins from New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to talk about COVID-19, to give us an update on COVID-19 and to give us an update on monkeypox um, um, infections. Um, you know that these are two particular um, diseases that have significantly impacted our communities. Black and people of color communities more dispor disproportionately than others. Um, so I don't know if Dr. Ige is on, and I don't. I can see Dr. Watkins is here. If Dr. Ige is not, then perhaps Dr. Watkins, you might want to go ahead, um, because you and Dr. Ige have thirty minutes up until quarter to five, quarter to six. Okay, for your dual presentations. Go ahead. Hello, um, I hope you can hear me. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Thank you for um, inviting us to the space. Oops. All right, that should be the right way. I hope it's the right way, yeah? Yeah, it's good, yeah, we can good. see you. Okay, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us. And hello, Antoine. Um, we've been working together in uh, T two uh, best interest work for a while. I'm happy to be in this space and really appreciate um, the, the the presentation uh, that we just heard. Um, I think the framing is so 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 important um, for our time, um, and I think we have to really think you know big picture. Um, to, to address all of these many crises that are overlapping and intersecting. Um, I have a I have a PowerPoint, uh, um, but I definitely do want to kind of think would be most effective if we made it um, conversational. So I want to share some main highlights and kind of bring folks up, uh, you know, bring folks up to speed. And I think if folks do have some questions, I want to want to leave some space if there's for questions um, in the end. Um, so, um, you know, if uh, Hopefully, hopefully I can answer the, the, the everything, the, the majority of questions um, during the presentation. I'll hop right into it. Dr. Ige um, should be able to join um, shortly, um, but I'll just get started. Uh, but first, I want to I want to start talking about uh, the conversation with uh, COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 definitely um, Changed, changed a lot of things, you know, about about our day to day lives and about the society, and really has exposed for many folks um, that not living in, in uh, you know living um, in our communities, coming from marginalized experience, to you know how how desperate the situation is. Um, but what I want to do is just show um, a visual representation of some of the trends over time with COVID nineteen as we enter in another fall and winter season, and really just to raise awareness uh, to the fact, you know, the last to fall and winter seasons have not been, uh, have actually been really, really tough, you know, on our city, um, but also nationally. And so, you know, for, for the COVID update, I really just want to really talk about what we can do to keep ourselves and our community safe um, by just sharing, you know, toolkits and what we can do to encourage, um, you know, safety um, and look at the tools that we do have and offer what can we do versus uh, um, what you shouldn't do. Uh, so just looking at the trends, uh, just at the very bottom of the screen, just to go over it quickly, um, mm -hmm. starting from the very far left, going from left to right at the bottom, you can see over time. So from the first, this, these are cases, uh, these, this, uh, this solid blue line represents case, average cases. So the first line just shows the number of cases that we were getting in that first wave that locked everything down. Um, you can see that the cases, they were high. Um, you can follow them through um, to winter. Um, of 2021, and you can see um, another kind of rise in cases um, that was uh, that was like that second wave that we experienced. Following uh, following that blue line um, a little bit forward, you can see this bump. Um, hopefully, you can see my mouse. You can see the delta where the delta um, variant hit, um, and then you can see last winter when the Omicron variant hit and definitely you know threw us for a big loop. Um, 
luckily or thankfully, you know, we're definitely in a much better place where to, when it comes to uh, the virus, when it comes to the, the current circulating variants, uh, because we have to, we do have some new tools in addition to some of the old tools that we, tools that we have, uh, but just wanted to, you know, again, talk about, look at this as, you know, what can we do um, and what can we possibly expect, um, you know, in the coming uh, weeks, months, as we kind of get into cold and flu season um, in the, in the era of uh, COVID-19. So I'd like to uh, start out and really just offer to let folks know what resources and what things, uh, what assets or what things we do have and what things we can rely on to keep us safe, you know, even without mandates and without having to wear the mask, having to do some of these things. All of these are things that, you know, have kept us safe, kept our community safe um, and things that we can continue um, without a mandate, and especially as we get into fall and winter, things that we should be considering, um, you know, relying, uh, falling back on uh, to keep ourselves safe. Um, so I'll, I'll review them, but just like the overview, folks have seen uh, some version of the core four, you know, now there's like, a, there's a few other tools that we have, but basically, you know, this concept of isolation, um, or, you know, social dis physical distancing to prevent change of transmission. If some, if you are sick or if you suspect that you are sick, you know, face masking is effective. We know that there's a lot more of the higher grade face masks and masks that are available, which are really helpful and useful, especially in this time of the year. And um, then going forward uh, at preventing um, infection, uh, get testing, routine testing on the next slide. I'll talk about uh, some of our, some of the ways that we can approach testing. Um, uh, just, you know, as a reminder, refresher um, into, you know, uh, cleaning our hands, washing our hands. That's all part of it. Don't have to remind folks on the call, but uh, we say it. And then finally, just thinking about, um, you know, the pharmaceutical interventions, um, you know, vaccines are out there. That's a part of this bigger landscape. Um, and even now, um, treatments, we have treatments available um, that are effective against, uh, that, that are effective against the viruses, uh, the COVID-19 virus, um, and that are more available, more, more widely available um, than they had been. Uh, in the past. So I'll just, I'll hop right into talking a little bit more about testing as a refresher. You know, when we think about testing, um, even if vaccinated, uh, getting tested, uh, we've seen the new variants um, of this virus, how it does change and kind of can evade or bypass some of the immunity that we have had um, in the past. Um, so, you know, getting tested, or thinking about getting tested, um, you know, when someone, when you have symptoms that may be similar to COVID-19, you know, it's not just, oh, it may be a cold, I just got the sniffles, you know, a rapid test um, when uh, when symptoms begin is a, it's definitely a, a, an important way to know your status, rule out COVID-19, um, and also kind of modify behavior just so you don't, you know, so you, so you can prevent any transmission or spread. Uh, to someone um, before before the diagnosis. Um, another recommendation for getting tested is after um, after being in close contact with someone uh, who's had it. You know, um, you know, if you were a possible exposure, uh, folks, no one's gonna call and make you quarantine at home. But we can really get, we can quarantine ourselves and do things to kind of keep ourselves uh, a little bit separate so that we don't uh, possibly spread it to someone else. Um, some other um, ways that folks can approach testing is after before or after travel. Um, or before or after, you know, uh, congreg being in a group setting, you know, at a concert or like at a big, you know, at a big family event or other things, getting tested before um, and after is, is something that, that we can do to help uh, know our status um, and to help, uh, you know, inform what we can do, uh, inform our actions. Uh, for the next slide, do want to say there is a new and updated um, vaccine out that actually is bivalent. So uh, that has two different targets. It has the target to help produce immunity against the original strain, but also it has targets uh, for uh, for the circulating variants, uh, these Omicron variants that are out now. Um, so the, vi the vaccine is available. It's available in uh, Pfizer and Moderna have, um, have two, have their own formulations. The Moderna vaccine is available for folks 18 and older. Uh, Pfizer is eligible for folks 12 and older. Um, folks who are eligible for vaccines, uh, mo most folks over 12, 12 and older are eligible to get their vaccines if it's been at least two months since your last dose or um, up to three months after um, after a recent infection, uh, folks can get vaccinated. Uh, we definitely saw um, at the very beginning when we saw you know all the case the case numbers that we saw during when Omicron first came out. But I, what we what I didn't show, but it, what is part of it is that hospitalizations and deaths were a lot lower. Um, I think a lot of that did have to do with the fact that even though the vaccines weren't able to prevent uh, 
uh, some of those infections uh, when we first saw Omicron on the scene, but they were still still safe and effective at preventing hospitalization and death. Um, and uh, the vex, the current these these boosters um, should also help uh, uh, help offer that same protection. Hopefully, a little better since they're made specifically against the Omicron variants. Um, treatment. So I talked about treatment on that first slide. So there are antiviral pills. There's also anti um, anti antibodies um, that folks can get if they are sick. Um, these are time limited. So if you are if you do develop symptoms of COVID and test positive within the first five days, you can start antiviral pills. Um, a lot of folks have used them. Even the president. Um, a lot of folks have tolerated them. Uh, well, and then also uh, the monoclonal antibodies. This treatment is something you have to see a provider's IV treatment, but it's a one-time treatment. So those are treatment options. We just want to make sure folks know that it's something. If you do test positive, um, reach out to a provider and call 311 to get connected. But this is something that um, if you do test positive and, and uh, there's there's interventions and things that we can do. Um, again, you know, vaccinations are, are a big part of this winter, fall, winter preparedness. What can we do to keep ourselves safe? So it's not just COVID-19 that's out there. Um, it's also influenza. You know, influenza happens. Thanks. Influenza is a yearly thing. It kills thousands of folks across the nation um, and affects a lot of folks in New York City. So getting our flu shots as well. Um, and then other seasonal things, you know, uh, life gets ahead of us. Uh, we get busy. It's been a difficult last few years. So this other bit is, uh, you know, for safety is just, you know, seeing our providers um, and uh, managing um, managing some of our underlying um, health conditions and concerns, making sure we get our checkups. All of this is part of uh, how we can keep ourselves safe. Um, so now we will transition into uh, the conversation around monkeypox. Um, we uh, we have adopted um, the acronym MPV. Um, so just want to acknowledge that, acknowledge that the name change uh, came uh, from a call from inter inside the agency, but also uh, folks in the communities um, to really name uh, this inaccurate way of describing this virus um, and, and acknowledging um, that the language can be seen as stigmatizing, not just uh, because of anti-Black sentiment um, and this, you know, using monkeys, um, but also um, it can be, uh, you can also discriminate against uh, folks, especially for folks who, um, who are experiencing the brunt of this current outbreak um, in New York City. Um, you know, we stigma is real. It's uh, it has real palpable effects, and um, it can really um, cause harm to folks. So we definitely we went we we have been calling as an agency for uh, for the intergovernmental agencies, national, international, um, and also on a local front. And we just uh, we made that uh, we made that decision at the transition. So MPV is how we will be uh, referring to the virus. Um, Understanding a lot of folks are familiar with uh, monkeypox, but as we try to as we transition um, our our agency to that, hopefully the or across the city we can have a transition to use MPV um, instead of this full name that inaccurately captures or describes this virus. Uh, so in terms of where we've where we have been and where we're going um, in the United States, uh, we have had uh, some of the highest case counts in the world and of all of the states of the United States. Uh, New York, New York has been the state with the highest number, and that was all driven by uh, that has all, that was all driven by the city of New York. We found ourselves as an as another epicenter of a of a rapidly evolving and changing public health crisis. Um, if you look at to the map to the left, this is from the the Centers for Disease Control, uh, you can see uh, some of the other uh, jurisdictions, some of the other states and territories, uh, the deeper the color, the higher the case counts. And as you can see, um, some of the places with, the, with our largest cities, you know, such as California, Texas, Georgia, Florida, um, New York, um, have had some of these higher outbreaks. So, you know, folks, it, folks living in urban areas uh, have been disproportionately affected. Uh, where where are we now and we're hopefully we're which direction do we keep going so what you see on the screen is a representation of the daily cases of MPV in New York City since the beginning of the outbreak um, if you follow from left to right across um, across the across the screen you'll see uh, where we had uh, the vertical up and down light blue lines represent daily case counts when we had the when we were at our peak or we had the most cases we we're having um, you know, upwards of nearly 100 folks a day um, testing positive uh, for um, MPV. Luckily, we were able to flatten that curve uh, through a lot of things, not just vaccines, a lot of folks community hopped into action. 
educating ourselves, um, changing behaviors, doing things to reduce our risk and spread information. That's how we got this. Uh, we got this uh, this outbreak under control. You can see if you follow to the right, you can see that that solid blue line really started to go down pretty drastically. And now, um, over the last few weeks, we've actually had case counts, daily case counts, less than ten folks being diagnosed a day in New York City. Um, so we've definitely come a, a mighty long way. We're not at zero. We hope to get there um, soon. Um, but, you know, uh, conversations like this, um, raising awareness and uh, working from our part um, as a city to um, uh, minimize barriers um, is, and um, inc increase access is all part of how we can keep this number down. Uh, just for some of the case data, I don't, I'm not going to dwell too long on this, but what we've seen that the, that the borough of Manhattan has been the most impacted um, in terms of vault number overall number, but you can see um, basically across uh, the five boroughs, but specifically some of the larger boroughs, um, we've seen that the case uh, that there has been, uh, the cases have affected uh, large, the, the other larger boroughs too. Staten Island has not been spared. Um, looking for across demographic groups, I think it's always important to kind of dig a little deeper. Um, so just looking across uh, some of the recent race, racial and ethnic uh, uh, distribution of the cases or who's getting uh, infected or diagnosed with um, MPV. So we see uh, folks who identify as Latina, Latinx, Hispanic, or Latino. Uh, those folks have, uh, have uh, that community has uh, had the, the highest burden of illness, um, followed by folks who identify as Black or African American. Um, uh, and then followed by folks who identify as white. Um, when we look at sexual orientation, do want to uh, acknowledge. So when we when we were talk when we report, uh, we report um, on uh, sexual orientation. So that's why the T is not in LGBTQ uh, because uh, you know trans identity versus um, uh, it is not a sexual orientation. But most folks are self identifying as uh, most folks who test positive self identify as LGBTQ. Um, and then uh, there are a number of folks who identify as straight. Um, but then acknowledging that some of these categories do not reflect, you know, behaviors, desires, um, and other things. We are, all, you know, you can at the bottom you can see that um, some folks aren't reporting, some folks decline. Um, but we also know that across the systems, don't uh, healthcare system we don't do so well connect collecting some of this data. Folks feel uncomfortable. Um, so just part of our work in the health department is raising awareness for the medical community to make sure that you know that we meet the standards, the necessary standards to take care of the city of you know a diverse uh, and rich city um, and, the, and this in our community. Um, so just kind of review, you know, who is at risk, um, anyone of any sexual orientation or gender identity, what I say, um, and talking, you know, anyone with skin, it, it can be infected with MPV. Um, we've seen that, that, um, that, that folks uh, in the LGB, uh, LGBTQ community have been disproportionately affected, specifically folks in um, social circles or social or social, social or sexual um, circles or networks of folks who are identifying as gay, uh, gay, bi, and other men who have sex with men. Um, but we also know um, about the diversity and richness of the, these social and sexual networks and you know, folks of trans experience and non-binary and non-conforming folks are also part of these part central vital to the community and part of these networks as well. Um, we also found that, that um, in, from case investigations, folks with multiple partners, um, folks who meet folks um, anonymously, um, uh, that's been a common thing that a common thing that we found. And so, just re re raising awareness um, that having um, having partners uh, can increase uh, expo uh, exposure. So how does this thing spread? There's a lot of discussion and a lot of debate around how the how the virus spreads. This is a communicable disease. It's passed from person to person through skin to skin contact. There's many different activities um, and social customs that humans engage in that um, involve skin to skin contact. Um, uh, also, um, the virus can spread through uh, contact through clothing, inanimate objects, things that aren't aligned, clothing, bedding, other things, through repeated um, uh, exposure. So what we've seen for folks who um, who got who've been infected in this current outbreak, um, folks you know living with a 
household contacts, you know, folks who've used similar utensils, share blankets, sleep on the same bed. That's how we've seen that transmission. Um, and then a less common, but uh, what we think is a possible, is a real mode of transmission and um, through respiratory droplets. That's why we recommend folks who are infected or concerned for MPV um, infection to wear a mask. Um, because we know that the, the virus can be isolated in these large respiratory droplets, similar to like COVID. Um, we can find the, the, the virus in the droplets, but thankfully um, this virus is a lot less efficient or contagious in, um, in the uh, through respiratory spread. Um, in terms of uh, when it spreads, you know, it can spread uh, when folks are having symptoms. That's when we know folks are the most infectious. Um, and specifically, you know, when folks have active lesions on their skin, that's when uh, that's where that's where uh, the majority of the virus um, can be um, is found. Uh, most folks are folks are contagious um, during the, while they are symptomatic. So uh, uh, while the skin lesions are there, uh, folks are are um, that's when you're that's when you're contagious. Um, so that's why the recommendation is for the to try to isolate, physically distance to prevent transmission until all skin um, lesions are healed up. Um, and healed, you know, it's not just a scab over. You want that scab to form. You want that scab to fall off and have a fresh layer um, of um, of skin. Symptoms uh, symptoms start um, within about two weeks of exposure, but can extend a bit. Uh, it can it can take a bit longer uh, to to um, to develop. Um, but when we think about symptoms, uh, talk about it two ways. Think about it's primarily skin presentation, but there are also um, your when you it's a, it's a systemic infection, you get infected, and uh, you can have some systemic or all body symptoms. So the skin symptoms, uh, the skin, the sores have a very typical appearance. They can look like little pimples with an umbilication. Think uh, umbilication, think belly button, a little little dip in the middle. That's what they look like. They can look um, very similar to pustules or they look like other kind of pox um, presentations for those of us who remember chicken pox. Um, can look similar to that. Uh, they can they typically have appeared on folks' um, faces or hands or feet um, in, all, in other outbreaks, but in this current outbreak, we've also found it in other parts of the body. Um, most, most concerning is when we find it on the, the what we call the mucosal surfaces or the, the pink part. So in our mouths, in the more sensitive areas, um, you know, in the genital region or the, uh, the anal genital region. Um, the sores can be very itchy and very discomfortable, uh, uncomfortable rather, and they can last, new ones can develop over the time, over two to four weeks, we've seen folks uh, start to develop uh, these lesions. Um, the kind of total body symptoms that folks are, have, have reported um, and are common are uh, flu-like symptoms or COVID-like symptoms. We've had folks uh, who were eventually diagnosed with um, MPV uh, who thought that it was thought that it was COVID-19 at first and you know took a rapid a rapid COVID test and took a deep breath only to develop um, the, the sores a bit later. Um, but also folks can have fever, chills, swollen lymph nodes, headache. Um, folks feel fatigue, exhaustion. These are all things that folks have reported uh, when they've been infected. And we found that some folks develop these kind of symptoms before uh, before the rashes, or some folks develop them all kind of at the same time. There's a lot of news out there that we want to make an aware, uh, raise awareness. And uh, for for the, the you know uh, Dr. Ige and I, we work in the Center for Health Equity, um, and so we uh, we're promoting you know access, 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 and expanding eligibility. That's what we that's what we push for, advocating for more folks to get uh, to break down barriers. So uh, happy to report that across New York City, first and second dose uh, appointments are available. Um, across all the city sites, folks can walk in for all of the, um, at, at all of the city sites. Um, we recommend folks, you know, you can make an appointment if you want to, but you can walk in at, uh, at any of the sites. Um, folks can get their second dose. We were able to, we, uh, we, uh, we were able to narrow the window to get the second dose. So folks can get that second dose as soon as four weeks after the first dose. Um, a note for folks who have recovered from um, MPV, um, there is a benefit. There is, you know, immunity that is de that uh, folks develop after an infection. You know, natural immunity, um, like similar conversations we've had around COVID nineteen. But but we but what we're seeing with um, MPV, we think that 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 this immunity is um is is pretty good and it lasts it lasts long. Uh, we're not sure exactly how long it's been lasting. Uh, but this is again, this is a new outbreak. It's been around for um 
seemed like forever, but not that not that long in the you know in our city in this current outbreak. And so we'll definitely be able to speak more to the duration of uh, of immunity from vaccinations and from uh, post infection um, with a more, lot more confidence um, in the coming uh, weeks months. Uh, for folks who do want updates, you can text monkeypox to six nine two six nine two. For folks who want to get um, updates um, in in Espanol, you can text um, monkeypox ESP uh, to the same to the same website all right another thing that has updated um and if, if i'm running out of time just let me know uh it looks like i have maybe 10 more minutes and i'm almost done uh a vaccine eligibility has has opened up as of yesterday Thirty thousand new appointments or doses have been made available across the city um and we opened up we've ex we've opened up eligibility it used to be very um post exposure we, we didn't have enough vaccines uh, to get to vaccinate everyone and so we uh, everyone who probably would benefit so we have to focus on what we call ring vaccination or just get the get the focus in the communities um, that have been most and um, most impacted luckily we've gotten to the point where there's a lot more vaccine available we've actually expanded so now folks of any sexual orientation or gender identity um, who have uh, anonymous uh, partners or more than one partner can are eligible um, they can seek a uh, meet a meet a uh, go talk to their medical provider and have that conversation and they're eligible um, people of any sexual orientation or gender identity maybe if personally you may not um, fall come into that risk of multiple partners um, but if any of your partners um, may have multiple partners or may be eligible for the vaccine folks can get it um, people who have been known to be exposed can also get vaccinated and anyone who considers themselves at risk can go and talk to a medical provider um, and, uh, and, and determine if uh, vaccination against MPV is the right decision for you and your health. Um, we just want to name some of the priority populations. So that's the eligibility, but we also name some of the um, priority populations. Just want to call out, you know, uh, cis, cis, uh, cisgendered women um, have been are included in this. We want to make sure that cis women um, know that they're available, that the vaccines are available to them now. And um, that was that was another kind of um, uh, eligibility criteria that. We've been pushing to ex expand towards folk, uh, cis, women, uh, cis, uh, cis women who are in these sexual networks or folks who may uh, be at risk for um, infection, um, trans folks, folks with trans identity, non-binary folks, gender non-conforming folks, um, anyone who's had an STI within the prior six months can, can, should consider um, uh, having this conversation and if this MPV vaccine is something that would be beneficial for them. Um, Folks who engage, um, uh, who participate um, in sex parties, or may participate in sex parties or other um, events. Um, folks who um, folks who who go to commercial sex venues. Um, also, um, being conscious of, uh, hey, Doctor Ige, conscious of uh, folks living with HIV. Um, folks, um, the folks who are on um, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV also encourage folks to really consider um, integrating an MPVs, you know, um, vaccination in their, um, you know, safety plan for their overall health um, also making sure to include folks um, who engage in sex work um, exotic uh, erotic workers the last the last uh, couple of years have definitely um, uh, changed the dynamics a lot of a lot of folks are um, um, are engaging in sex work um, just making sure you know acknowledging um, the folks uh, uh, the diversity of uh, of experience and making sure that folks they feel like if they, they feel that they need they want to make it available um, just looking at some of the overall vaccines, we've vaccinated, oh, administered over 130 vaccines across the city of New York, um, which has been um, a, a really a true, uh, true marvel. Um, but just looking at some of the equity uh, points before we, uh, before we um, end and open up. Um, what we do, we have a lot of work cut, cut out for us. Dr. Ian and I, our teams, we're working a lot to really close some of these equity gaps. These visuals are on, their, th this data is on the website, but that's basically what we look at. We want the purple line to extend further out than the gray line. The gray is doses administered. The gray line is um, percentage of folks of any particular demographic uh, who, would, who would benefit. And basically, we see that the purple line is um, extends out further than the gray line for every group except for Black folks, and you know um, that's a that's a big inequity. Um, uh, black folks, um, African American folks, um, have been uh, the least under vaccinated, um, and not you know. And I think folks 
into say mistrust but we also know that there's a lack of there's a lack of confidence in systems folks have been failed by the systems and you know we're definitely dedicated to make sure that we can address some address these issues these barriers and make sure that we can do uh, the best in our power um, to prevent those things those those sorts of things from happening again um to the right you can see in the bronx uh that there that more folks would probably benefit than who have received vaccines. We can also see in Queens uh, that uh, that inequity is not as large in Queens. And then for Staten Island, you see uh, folks in Staten Island could also um, use more vaccines. So we're definitely we're working with our community partners to do engagement, you know, in these boroughs, meeting folks where they are. We're working with um, the health and hospitals to bring um, uh, vaccine vans to events. Um, social events, uh, some folks in um, sex parties and other places just to make sure that we meet folks where they are, make it easy for folks. Um, and finally, uh, I think uh, maybe one more. Uh, we can we can stop after this slide. Uh, we don't also want to make take into um, account um, age um, and inequities in age. So folks um, 45 and older um, could uh, could you could would probably benefit from getting MPV vaccine. Um, vaccinated more and then folks um, 24 and younger um, also uh, we, we definitely want to make sure that the vaccine is more available for folks in that age group as well folks in 25 to 44 um, age range have had the highest number of cases so it's uh, I think it's really good to see that that the people of in that age demographic group have been um, highly vaccinated, um, but we definitely want to make sure that we get that equity. We want to make sure that purple line extends farther out uh, for folks 24 and younger um, and folks uh, 45 and up. I see Dr. Ige is there. I will stop here um, and we can um, open up the convo because I think we do have a bit more time. Um, thank you, thank everyone. You, yeah. Go ahead. Go, go, go ahead, Dr. E Ige. Thank you and welcome. Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I responded to um, one of the questions in the chat. Um, we apologize for the uh, mixed communication. So when the vaccines, the MPV vaccines first arrived, we didn't have enough doses. So at that time, we were restricting doses to just first doses. Uh, and so um, some people had challenges scheduling their second dose, uh, but now there is more supply available. So if you got your first dose, we're encouraging you to please go ahead and schedule your second dose. You'll be able to do that online. And now you don't even need to schedule an appointment for a second dose. You can walk into any of the city run sites uh, to get your second dose. So that's been the confusion. Uh, at the beginning, uh, it was hard to schedule your second dose because we didn't have enough supply. We wanted everyone to at least get one dose first. And now we have enough supply. So um, if you're missing your second dose, please go ahead and schedule uh, your, your second dose appointment. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions or comments from community members about Yes, uh, somebody's asked a question here about side effects and um, to the monkey MPV vaccine and what are they? Um, what are what are some of the side effects? Um, I can. Do you want to, Doctor? Uh, you, you can. You can go ahead, uh, Doctor. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. So um, there's a couple different mechanisms of administration. Uh, the 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 traditional way um is called subcutaneous. Sub meaning below cutaneous skin. So in a layer below the skin, um, subcutaneous administration is associated with you know local. Uh, low pain at the site where you get the shot where the needle goes in that can hurt folks uh, feel some soreness in the in the few days after some folks have experienced um that that, that post vaccine kind of you know fever some folks kind of feel chills um achiness uh, some folks have reported that as well there's also this other mechanism of administration called intradermal intra meaning between dermal uh the surface layers of the skin so it's a very shallow injection um of the of the vaccine of a smaller amount but uh in the skin of the forearm um it's been associated it can the smaller amount can produce um a, a good immune response uh but some of the side effects are all based on just the local um injection where it is so folks um experience um 
uh, you know, the same kind of uh, tenderness at the site of the vaccine. Uh, but after the like after getting vaccinated, some folks have have a bit more redness that can last for a bit longer, up to weeks. Um, some folks um, experience some swelling there, uh, and in very rare cases, um, it has been reported that folks have um, developed uh, scars, like a, a small like a scar at the site, um, something called a keloid, a thickening uh, a thickened scar for folks who have a history of keloids or a family history. Um, folks can actually um, talk to their talk to the, their provider when they're going to get vaccinated, and they would just uh, use the subcutaneous administration to prevent um, that risk. Um, I mean, hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions or thoughts or comments? Thank you very much for that, Dr. Watkins. Um, yes, anything I you know. might want to hang on. Anything you might want to share with us, uh, Dr. Ige, about COVID that where we are with respect to the pandemic. I mean, you got, well, you're at 545, but I'll give you a few more minutes to um, talk a little bit more about COVID and where we are with the pandemic. You know, are we moving from pandemic to epidemic or where are we? Uh, so thank you, um, Antoine, for, for that question. So one thing I want people to remember is that we still have, um, about 1600 cases of COVID per day, per day. So COVID is still here. It is much less than we've had at other times, but 1600 cases of COVID every day is still significant. We are seeing cases trend upwards and we have learned over the last three years, once you start seeing cases go up in one location, it is a signal that cases will now start rising in other locations. Um, we Number two, three, we have seen new variants emerge outside of the country, and we have learned that it is a matter of time before those new variants come here. So what can you do to prepare for the fall and the winter season? Uh, the most important thing you can do right now is get your updated booster. If your enemy is not giving up, then you should not give up in preparing your response. So that's our poster right now in the city. Uh, the virus is more aggressive. There are new variants on the way. We are seeing cases start climbing up again as it's usual in the fall and winter. So we want all hands on deck again. We have had some period of respite. We have gone without our mask for a while. Now it may be that we need to show up our protections again. So starting with getting your booster, getting your flu shot so you're ready. And then it may happen that we will start pushing for, back, um, for mask wearing again, especially indoors as cases rise. So this is the pattern we with COVID. It's up today, down tomorrow. So if you hear that our recommendations change, it is in response to whatever is happening um, um, by the virus. So that's where we are with the pandemic, cases are rising. And so we are calling on all you New Yorkers to get prepared for fall and winter, get your booster shot and get your mask close by. Thank you very much, Dr. Ige. I've seen Matthew Alvarez has got his hand up and then I have got a question in, 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 um, um, in the chat from Dr. Perry. So Matthew, would you wanna go ahead? Yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. I was wondering, and I noted that you guys adopted the MPV name. I did hear at one time that that wasn't gonna be adopted and rather we were gonna go with the ortho pox virus. So what, where did that, where does that stand and why wasn't that adopted? Um, I can say a little about that. So orthopox is not um, only responsible for monkeypox as, as um, a disease. So it is not specific. Um, so the, the, the debate about using orthopox as a general catch-all um, was debated. Ultimately, uh, we thought it was well, the, the World Health Organization, the departments and other uh, national bodies felt MPV, which is more specific to the disease condition uh, that represents monkeypox virus, uh, will be a better alternative than just saying monkeypox. So those were some of the nuances there. 
Um, monkeypox is uh, also pox virus is the family of viruses that causes monkeypox, but the specific uh, virus uh, itself is uh, the monkeypox virus, and that's why it ended up with MPV. Thank you very much, Dr. Ige. Um, the question um, from Dr. Perry in the chat is the CDC use its special authorization to use testing at Quest to test for COVID. How is this information being used? Yes, so in public health, surveillance is a huge part of our work. We can prepare if we don't know what is coming. Uh, we can't know what is coming if we don't have data. So testing is really vital for us to see when cases are climbing, if there is a new disease coming, if things are getting better or not. So um, the availability of testing and the ability to track um, new diseases, what is positive, et cetera, is vital for a public response. So when people get tested for an infectious disease, anything that has the potential to spread, uh, it is mandatory reporting. Uh, so all agencies are required to report when there's an infectious disease uh, and that data is used to plan for an appropriate response. So that's that's how the data from Quest and other testing locations for monkeypox is being used to prepare. Um, when do we need to get vaccines? Do we need to increase or decrease our, our, our response, et cetera? So that's how it's used. Thank you very much, Dr. Ige. Um, but Dr. Perry is adding that this was a regular blood test, that apparently she went for a blood test and it was also screened at the time for COVID. And she was wondering how is that information being used or what is being used? What is that being done? Um, oh, used for COVID, for? not for monkeypox? Oh, um, for routine testing for COVID. Um, that's unusual. Usually uh, people request tests for COVID based on symptoms or based on exposure. Uh, if you're being tested for COVID without symptoms or without you're requesting for the test, it's a little unusual. Uh, if there is a study or something being done, usually the patient will be asked um, to participate. Uh, so the way COVID tests are run right now is you either go seek a test uh, because you have been exposed or because you have symptoms. And then if that test comes back positive, it is reported. Uh, at the moment, only positive cases are being tracked. Um, and, and that's positive. Uh, PCR test or positive antigen test. We're not able to track at home tests at the moment. So um, we may need to dig a little more into what happened with, with Quest Diagnostic um, in, in your case. If you didn't request the test and, and it was just done, that's a little unusual. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Yiga. I have one more final question. Um, and I think, oh, I think Dr. Watkins is just answering that question in chat. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Walker. You just saved me a whole, uh, you know, <laughs> you just saved me a whole spiel just now. All right. Um, so I think the question is: Please say a word about hand sanitizers. Does it work with violent reduction on hands? Can it take the place of soap and water? I see increased use of hand sanitizer even when soap and water is available. And Doctor Watkins respond by saying hand sanitizers are effective. My rule of thumb is: if you can use soap and water, you should. Sanitizers are good for on the go. And that's the exactly question specifically right. Specifically, it's about viruses, though. It's my understanding that they used to be years ago only for like bacterial stuff, but they now work for viruses. Maybe they've improved them. Thank you. Well, no, they have. They yeah. have. They have antibacterial um, soaps, but those aren't necessary. The point is, you want hot water. You want to use a soap, and you want to do it thoroughly. So the twenty second, uh, the, the twenty second was want to wash your hands thoroughly, but they are effective, and you don't need an antiviral or antibacterial soap um, for it to work. Yes, and and okay. hand sanitizers because of the concentration of alcohol. Remember that we use alcohol for sterilization, so alcohol will also kill viruses at the right concentration. Um, please note that not all hand sanitizers are made the same. We have had some hand sanitizers recalled because of you know some dangerous uh, ingredients that have been included, but um, hand sanitizers approved by the FDA are effective in reducing viral replication and reducing viral load um, on the go. 
but the preference is always to wash your hands whenever you can. Can I make one last point? Because we, when I worked in hospital, we never used alcohol to sterilize. We had to get things at a certain temperature, they would clean, but they didn't kill viruses. That was my really my specific is that they were for bacteria and other things. So with, with these viruses being um, COVID and others, they're viruses, but you all, it sounds like you're saying they've done some improvements because I see when we go to the lab, the lab tech is standing by the sink and instead of using soap and water, they get hand sanitizer because they think it's as good as, that was kind of my question. Should hmm. they be, should I bug them about wash your hands or if please they're do. okay? Okay, <laughs> thank please you. Please do, please do. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Egan. Thank you very much, Dr. Watkins. Um, and we just wanna move on quickly now to